Charles Barkley is preparing to retire from TV, probably. Plus, MLB faces a new frontier on maintaining the integrity of the sport, and cricket fever is alive and well in the U.S. Plus, we'll hear from an MLB pitcher who was delivering pizzas not so long ago. It's Monday, June 17th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Uncertainty hangs over TNT and its Inside the NBA quartet of Charles Barkley, Shaq, Kenny Smith, and Ernie Johnson as the NBA finalizes its next set of media rights contracts. But one of those four, perhaps the most desirable to a rival network, has taken himself out of the equation. Barkley announced that the next NBA season will be his last on TV. If he holds to that, he will be unaffected by the results of the NBA's negotiations because the league's deal with TNT and its other media contracts run through the 2024-25 season. Barkley said, I've talked to all the other networks, but I ain't going nowhere other than TNT. But I have made the decision myself, no matter what happens, next year is going to be my last year on television. He went on to say that he would pass the baton to Jamal Crawford, Vince Carter, or Steve Smith, who was present with him when he made the announcement. It's not Barkley's decision who replaces him, nor is it a given that inside the NBA will still exist after next year. But if it does, Crawford, Carter, and Smith all make sense as current TNT analysts and former players. Barkley had been a vocal critic of how Warner Bros. Discovery handled NBA negotiations and was a potentially massive free agent if they lose the NBA, but his decision to retire diffuses what could have been a very messy breakup. Pat Hoberg is an MLB umpire who worked during the postseason last year and is generally given high marks for his accurate calls. However, he has not appeared in a regular season game this year because he is under investigation for violating the league's gambling policy. We don't know exactly what he's been accused of right now, but the league did release a statement which noted, quote, while MLB's investigation did not find any evidence that games worked by Mr. Hoberg were compromised or manipulated in any way, MLB determined that discipline was warranted. Mr. Hoberg has chosen to appeal that determination. Therefore, we cannot comment further until the appeal process is concluded. The ubiquity of sports betting creates an ever-present danger to the integrity of sports, and that's especially true when it comes to umpires and referees. MLB umpires make six-figure salaries, which is more than most people, but it's easier to imagine them being swept up in a corrupt betting scheme than players making seven and eight figures, especially given their ability to manipulate the performances of specific players. Umpires have to make borderline calls many times a game. If fans or players believe that they might be motivated by anything other than a desire to make the right call, it could present a huge perception problem for the game. And the United States has shocked the world by making it through to the Super 8 stage of the T20 Cricket World Cup. They will have matches this week against South Africa, the West Indies, and England. Those will take place in Antigua and Barbados. Every one of those matches will be a chance for the team to keep cricket fever going in the U.S. This reminds me of soccer in 1994, which was the second time in first and 60 years when the U.S. made it to the round of 16 in the FIFA World Cup. Until then, soccer had largely been perceived as a sport that other countries were serious about, but not the U.S., at least not in international competitions. Major League Soccer began two years later. Now we're having a similar moment in cricket, with the U.S.-based Major League Cricket set to begin its second season next month. I'm joined now by St. Louis Cardinals pitcher Chris Roycroft. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for having me, on. Great to have you on. Um, I'm basically gonna, gonna start by reading your LinkedIn page. Uh, so since 2016, you've been a delivery driver for Jimmy John's, a customer service specialist at Dick's Sporting Goods, shop employee at Frank's Classic Cars. And then a few months before your 24th birthday in 2021, you made the transition to professional baseball player, first with the Joliet Slammers and then the St. Louis Cardinals. Last year, you went through three minor league levels and earlier this month, made your MLB debut. Uh, first of all, congrats. Uh, second, how did you make this particular career pivot into the baseball world? Oh, wow. Um, kind of just really, it was it was COVID year. That was kind of when I made the, the big decision to pursue baseball professionally. And that was, it was a rough year, I think, for everyone. And um, I was like you said, working a ton of different jobs. Um, I worked for, I worked at this mechanic. Um, I was working a liquor distributor job. Um, so really like three different jobs. I was also doing lessons and coaching on top of all that. 
and on top of all the training because I was trying to get back to to playing and pursuing the career. And so just kind of like trying to make ends meet and pay bills because, you know, you're 24 and or I was not 24 then, but um, just trying to pay off my bills, pay off my loans and uh, make ends meet all while trying to pursue a dream too. So, um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of yeah. hard going into that. Right. And yeah, talk to me about that decision to like really go for it because yeah, like you said, you're, you're in your early twenties, you've got loans, um, you know, you're, you're just kind of patching together a, bu a bunch of, of different jobs. Um, was, did it feel like you were taking a big risk to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going for baseball. It was a really big risk. Um, and I knew that. And I think when I was in college playing basketball and, and baseball, cause I walked on for baseball, I was originally just recruited for basketball at Aurora. And then like my sophomore year rolled around and I was like, I kind of need to like just pick one. And I ended up choosing baseball. And I've always loved baseball as a kid since I was like four years old. And, you know, that was that was always my my favorite. So um, I don't know, I, maybe it wasn't such a hard choice, but at the time it was a very difficult decision. And then once I chose that, I kind of just, you know, went all in on it and kept making strides and strides in my development and doing better and um yeah just uh I think that sophomore year that was that was when I really decided you know to go for it and I didn't look back then mm -hmm. yeah and when you were you know working these various jobs just like logistically when were you finding time to to train and you know were you you know getting up super early was it after work or was it just any time you could fit it in? What, what were you like? Yeah. What time of day was all this happening? Uh, uh, looking back. So yeah, I would just find time in between. So like usually like your typical nine to five, uh, that takes up most of your day. Um, so I would, I would train in the mornings. I would start at like four o'clock, five o'clock, go to the gym, yeah. train. Um, and I, at one point I was for a while, uh, I think it was like for about a year, I think it was in 20, probably the COVID year. I was, I was honestly just going training in the morning, working out, work my job and then come back home, eat a little bit and then go back to the gym, train more and then go to my second job, wow. which was the training and it, it Honestly, it kind of worked out pretty well because it was private lessons. So I was doing that and, you know, teaching kids how to play baseball, how to throw a baseball. And so I was there at the facility. And so it allowed me to to develop other people, but also be the same place where I trained. So like I would have like a little hour block. I'd go and I'd train and then I'd have like three or four lessons and then be done for the rest of the day. Uh, but at this point, we must be talking something, I don't know, like 8 p.m. or something when you're when you're maybe going home for the day. Uh, probably like 930, 10. Uh huh. So yeah. something like five or six in the morning to 930 or 10 at night, you know, with a couple meal breaks or either working or training um, for probably what, a couple years. Um, yeah, since 20. 2020 to like 2021. So yeah, about a year of uh -huh, doing that. Okay. And just like, there are days where I woke up out of bed and I'm like, it's 430. And I did not want to train. And yeah, um, I mean, in those days difficult. when yeah, yeah, well, you're driving delivery, how would you uh, get yourself out of bed when there's not necessarily anyone telling you to do that? It's just, I mean, it's your own self motivation. But did you ever think like, what if I didn't do this? What if I just, you know, made my life a little easier and, and let myself sleep? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's like the easy way out, right? I mean, I think 
maybe it's it's easy to fall into that pattern of like oh I, i'll just sleep in and just like 15 more minutes right and um i think in my head i always knew like looking at it long term and like hey like it's gonna suck right now but in the long term it's gonna be worth it and just mm-hmm. like just that constant reminder of like hey look at the bigger picture like if this is what you really want, you're going to do it. Yeah. And, and how confident most often were you? It, it was. Uh-huh. Yeah. And how confident were you that you were going to at least make in, into a professional baseball system and eventually to the major leagues? Uh, I would say like to start, I knew it was going to be a lot of work and I knew it was going to take a lot of sacrifice, a lot of discipline. And I knew maybe it was, something that wasn't obtainable. Um, So that was always in the back of my mind. But I think that helped me uh, motivate me in a sense to where like, hey, like, I'm just gonna give it all I have every single day. And if it doesn't work out, like, I didn't want to be the guy that's, you know, 40 years old, looking back at life and being like, Oh man, what if like, you know what I mean? Uh Like, I didn't want to be like that type of that type of person. So, uh, I really just kind of devoted everything I had into it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and let's go to last year and, you know, for, for the first part of this year, you're in the minor leagues. Give me kind of that, that same kind of, um, your daily schedule, if you had one, uh, for minor league baseball life. Yeah, so uh, for audience that doesn't know my story, um, I got signed on my birthday with the Cardinals in 21, or sorry, 22, um, out of independent ball. And I finished off the rest of the year in high A in Peoria. And then my first spring training in 23, and then I got sent to Peoria again. And, you know, I spent like maybe a month in, in Peoria and, and then I got to call up to double A to Springfield. And at that point, like my first outing was terrible. (laughs) I think I gave up like eight runs or something like that. Uh Um, and then like, I was like, well, that was like, to me, that was the biggest challenge I've ever faced in my baseball career. And it was like that jump from high A to double A was tough. Like that's one of the more significant jumps. It's like either you can play or you can't play. And um, that's kind of like the determining factor. And, you know, I remember having a conversation with uh, one of our pitching coordinators, uh, Tim Lebeck, and uh, he was like, hey, like basically just, you know, you're, you're here for a reason, like you belong, like just remember what you're here you know, you're here for a reason. And, you know, I kind of took that to heart and I just stuck to my process and uh, just really, I, I started pitching, start pitching pretty well. And uh, from there, it was only like maybe four weeks. I think July 4th is when I got called up to AAA. Then I finished uh, the rest of the season there in AAA in Memphis. Um, and then once I got to Memphis, it was like, okay, like, now it's like really obtainable now in my head, like mm-hmm. I've gained confidence through all the levels and the Cardinals are like really, really a good organization. That's been super, super supportive and they've been growing my confidence and um, I can't really thank them enough for doing that. Um, and so maybe then to answer your, your question now to dive down that um, I guess my, my standard, like, what does my day look like in the minor leagues? Um, so, like, you wake up in the morning. Um, I probably tend to wake up a little bit later, like maybe 830, um, mm-hmm. which really isn't that late comparative to um, some other guys. But uh, <laughs> you like to sleep mm-hmm. in there. Um, so then I, I, like, take a cold shower to start off my day. It's like. I've been doing that for, I want to say it's probably been like a year and a half of doing that every day Uh without missing a beat. Um, Mm -hmm. 
And that kind of just sets the tone for the day. Um, it's like the hardest thing you do every day. And then it's like the rest of your day is a breeze. <laughs> All right. Um, and then from by. there, you know, yeah, exactly. You just, you get some breakfast, um, kind of chill out for a little bit and then you head to the field. Once you have to field, it's like typical, typical work day. Um, you could lift, uh, you could throw like it was just getting ready for the game. And yeah. then the game happens and um, go home and get some sleep and do it all over again. Yeah. Um, just looking back on these few years, what what part would you say just like was the hardest, like, you know, physically, mentally, um, you know, was it when you're in the minors or was it, you know, when you're you're working these odd jobs and also training or is it, you know, right up to the point where you're getting to the majors? What's what's the what was the most challenging part there? The cha most challenging, oh man, um, probably in indie ball. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I, I personally, I love my experience in indie ball, and I would say like I've had some great teammates and like met some brothers that and some friends like that I'll have for the rest of my life, and um, like it's kind of similar. We're all there for a reason. We're all trying to get a job at the next level in affiliated ball. And so like, it wasn't necessarily like a competition between us, but it was like, all right, like who's gonna work harder? Like, you know what I mean? And um, just like pushing each other to the max. That was, that was the craziest part. But the biggest challenge, um, like I said, I mean, it was probably double A for me. Mm -hmm. Um, just, just from making that jump and, um, just seeing all the raw talent in double A and like as a D3 guy and an independent ball guy, like, yeah, I'd, I'd face some, some, some guys, some prospects that have been out of the system, but to be like in the system now and facing like, you know, yeah. D1 prospects and big names and being able to like stand my own, stand my ground and compete against those guys. That was, I mean, it didn't always go great. It didn't always get strikeouts, gave up home runs. Like it happens. It's part of the game. Yeah. But, um, there was a while there. I was like, Oh crap. Like, <laughs> uh, am I going to get cut? Am I going to get released? Like, <laughs> You know, yeah, and yeah. I think when I started shifting my mindset to like, why am I worrying about the past? Why am I worrying about the future? Like, let's just stay in the present. Let's just worry about the now and worrying about controlling what I can control and just trusting the process. And once I started doing that, everything else just kind of just like mellowed out and clicked. And that's that's probably when I made the big jump. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. And do you, do you feel like you and, and your teammates in, you know, when, when you're in the, the Cardinal system that you guys had, you know, like economic security, basically, like, you know, you're, you're, you're getting, you were getting enough money playing, but also like, you know, the, that you'd be okay if, if things didn't work out or, or was it, you know, how, uh, uh how uncertain were those times? uh they can be uncertain um i might be a little biased coming from indie ball where you know you make i think it's like 400 bucks after taxes a oh, month. Wow. uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> so you can see why i worked a couple sure. other jobs um in between for sure mm -hmm. just to make ends meet because the playing indie ball doesn't doesn't pay the bills at all um but with the new CBA and everything, um, it's a little bit more obtainable. But it's still it's still a grind. Um, you still you still have to devote everything you have into it, and and if not more, um, to to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, it's definitely a risk yeah. for sure. 
And we're living in an age that is more quantified than it's ever been when it comes to baseball and MLB just released bat speed data. And so, and, you know, of course I can look up your velocity, your spin rate, you know, how much your pitches break in either direction. Um, what do you think that does for um, how teams are discovering players and developing players, maybe even how players are developing themselves? I think it's great. I think it's great for the kids. Obviously now with like the StatCast era, so like we can see all exit velocity and launch angle and uh, like you said, pitch velocity. Um, I think all that stuff is, is great for the game. It's, it's cool. Um, it's cool to see like, oh, this guy's throwing 100. Mm -hmm. Like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it kind of highlights how, how tough this game is. Um, and the level of, of talent and uh, competition that, that you have to have to play at the, at the highest mm -hmm. level. And um, I think it, I think it's yeah. great. And uh, last question for you. What's been the most surreal, like I'm in the big leagues moment you've had in your, your, your young MLB career? <laughs> uh, so when I, I had never fly private at all ever. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't even know what it would look like. So the first, uh, big league flight was, was very memorable for me. Um, just like not having to go through security. Like, yeah, obviously it's like they pat you down and stuff and, um, you just kind of walk onto the tarmac and you see the plane there and you walk up the steps and you're on a plane and a nice recliner and, <laughs> You know, it's just like, wow, um, this is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah sounds nice. Um, all right, Chris Roycroft, again, congratulations on making it to the big leagues. Enjoy the show, and uh, thanks so much for joining us on this show. Thank you all for having me. That is it for today. Happy Father's Day, one day late to all the dads out there. If you have a friend or two who might enjoy the show, go ahead and tell them or share this episode, especially if they could use a shot of motivation to pursue their dreams. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.